Hello everyone. My name is Alexander Matelaar. I work for the Institute for European Studies in Brussels and I do research in our cluster on European foreign and security policy. Today I will be giving you a brief introduction to the EU's common security and defense policy and the role it plays in the broader uh, political architecture of European integration. Now, the European Union is currently uh, engaged in uh, taking its, its, its first steps in the recent years in the domain of, of, of military uh, affairs and, and defense matters. But it hasn't always uh, been, been active in, in, in that realm. So it's, uh, it's probably a good starting point um, to ask ourselves the question how that development came about in the first place. And as far as the, the sort of analytical perspective uh, that we uh, need to keep in mind to, to study all of this. It's important to keep in the back of our minds that whatever happens um, in, uh, in European integration and the addition of new policy areas to the spectrum of what the European Union is doing, that uh, any such an addition is inevitably a compromise solution that all the different member states have to agree upon. So if you want to understand how the uh, common security and defense policy of the uh, European Union emerged, it's important to track how the individual positions of the constitutive member states of the Union converged towards the idea that, yes, the European Union is an international organization that should um, uh, interest itself for matters pertaining to international uh, security and, and world peace. <clears throat> now, let us start with some history. Um, as you uh, undoubtedly know, um, in, in the broader historical picture of European integration, uh, for, for most of that history there actually uh, existed uh, some uh, division of labor between what the European Community and later on the European Union was doing and what another big organization, the, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, uh, was doing. So the division of labor that existed and that actually emerged in the, in the aftermath of the, of the Second World War was that European economic integration was taking place uh, in, the, in the context of, uh, of the building up of the European uh, community and the, and, and the European Union, something that was based on a supranational mode of, of policy making, i.e. Uh, meaning that, that member states delegated policy-making authority to supranational institutions, but everything that pertained to uh, matters of, uh, of, of, of foreign policy proper and, and defense policy in particular, uh, such cooperation was taking place uh, amongst um, European states as well as European states on the one hand and, uh, and North, North American states on, on, on the other, but that cooperation took place on a, on a purely intergovernmental basis, meaning that it was not about, uh, about pooling sovereignty in, in the same way that, uh, that we saw in the, in, in, in the economic realm. Now, <clears throat> before we go into the, the precise question of the division of, of labor between NATO and the European Union, it's, it's important to keep in mind that already uh, more than half a century ago, there were discussions about having a European defense policy. Actually, that, uh, that whole debate started rolling already in the, in, in, in the late 40s, when first Britain and France approached each other um, on, on, on defense cooperation, the Treaty of Dunkirk, um, then the, the Treaty of Brussels was signed, leading to the setting up of something called the Western European Union, like a European defense organization, and also within um, the, the, the broader context of European uh, cooperation as it started emerging in the 1950s, uh, there was also the proposal put on the table uh, to set up uh, a European defense community uh, uh, in parallel to all the other initiatives that, 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 were, that were taking place. But at, at, the early, at the early days of European integration, the idea of, of cooperating in matters of defense, that was, that was considered to be a bridge too far. So European integration proper started, started off in the, uh, in the realm of economic cooperation and everything that pertained to defense was kept uh, uh, 
limited to a, an intergovernmental mode of, of, of cooperation that eventually only took off properly when the Americans got involved, when the Washington Treaty uh, established uh, NATO uh, and that essentially set the, the picture of the, of the European security architecture for the remainder uh, of, uh, of the 20th uh, century until the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. <coughs> so <coughs> in, in, in that term of, of history of the, of, of the Cold War, we had a very clear-cut division of labor where the European Union simply did not get involved uh, with, uh, with defense or security matters whatsoever. Um, defense policy was, uh, was conducted uh, within, within NATO and to some extent uh, on, on a bilateral basis, uh, for example, countries like France um, and, and other countries that, uh, that, had, uh, that were carrying um, a legacy of, uh, of, 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 I think, colonial uh, territories, um, they were conducting all that on a, on, a, on a national basis. Of course, one big event then changed everything, and that was the implosion of, of the Soviet Union uh, and de facto the end of the Cold War as we had experienced it in Europe uh, for, uh, for multiple decades. The, the end of the Cold War for Europe uh, proved to be uh, a wonderful thing because it allowed uh, Europe to be reunified, um, expanded, enlarged. Uh, but the whole enlargement story goes, uh, goes beyond the, the scope of this talk. But there, of course, was also a very negative side effect of the end of the Cold War, and that was that uh, some other parts of the world um, underwent um, a sort of disintegrating uh, process. So on the one hand, we saw the, the implosion of, uh, of the state of, of, of the former uh, Yugoslavia, uh, leading to a series of, of civil wars in, in the Balkans, uh, right uh, in, in Europe's backyard. And there was also uh, a lot of instability that erupted throughout the African continent, where uh, of, during the Cold War, the superpowers had been propping up regimes. Now that they lacked any incentive to, to engage with um, upholding balance of power in, in Africa, a lot of uh, uh, African countries plunged into civil war as well. That had the major effect of transforming uh, what we now call peacekeeping and, and crisis management. It was totally a niche affair during the Cold War, but it suddenly became the most pressing security challenge of the day. Um, uh, especially in, uh, in, the, in the former Yugoslavia, the, the war in Bosnia ended up drawing in a lot of external involvement, uh, first through UN peacekeeping, eventually multiple years down, um, the, down into the history of, uh, of the Balkan Wars, leading to NATO intervention, and nowadays we see that the European Union is, is heavily implicating in, in, in the long-term resolution of the conflicts in, uh, in, in the Balkans. So what I effectively happened was that um, the, uh, the entire mindset and the agenda of, of, of defense policymakers uh, suddenly changed around 1990. So from the 1990s onwards, all the European states got gradually drawn into the business of stabilizing ongoing conflicts and ongoing civil wars. Um, <clears throat> that uh, included, for example, peacekeeping in the Balkans, but also peacekeeping in, in various African countries. Think Somalia, think Rwanda, think the Congo. <clears throat> and the, uh, the agenda of defense policy making shifted entirely into, into that direction, to such an extent that the idea of, of crisis management became the, the principal topic uh, to be discussed in, 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 in defense uh, forums in the uh, in the course of the of the 1990s. So it was in the context of that shift from territorial defense to crisis management being the hottest issue on the defense agenda that we must situate the emergence of the EU's security and defense policy. But before we go in, into that, it is important to um, briefly zoom in on the individual positions. That, uh, that the big member states had with regards to everything that was going on, the changing landscape of, of, of international security. 
we, we will zoom in on the positions of the big member states because they have essentially have the, the mass and authority um, to steer the, the debate into uh, a particular direction. The, the smaller member states also, of course, uh, have a voice in, in this debate, but they tend to, to cluster around the positions of one of the, of the bigger member states and form little alliances to, to steer the debate in one particular direction. But just to get the, the basic positions <coughs> on the, the, the direction of, uh, of defense thinking in, in, in Europe on, on the table, uh, let's, let's zoom in on the positions of, of the United Kingdom, France and Germany. <coughs> the, the United Kingdom is the member state that sees itself as the defender of the West, the natural bridge between the European continent and the American allies on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. <coughs> as you will uh, probably know, the, you know, the British have uh, a very professional set of, of armed forces. They have a tradition of, of projecting uh, their, their mil military might uh, at, at long distances. So they have a, a strong and consolidated defense establishment, but that is very, very tied in with um, uh, the defense establishment of the United States. So the United Kingdom sees itself as being one of the most important players in European defense, but it approaches this whole, um, this whole debate with the idea that European defense needs to be tied in to uh, um, the, the strategy of the, of the United States so that together Europe and the United States form the West. <clears throat> if there is one thing that the British worry about, it is that Europe uh, would lose its relevance as an ally to the United States. The British position is that um, the Europeans are in, um, have the best chances for influencing US policy making if they have something to contribute um, in, uh, in the debates. On, on international peace and security. So the Europeans need to make themselves useful as allies to be able to, to plug into uh, the debate on, on global security in which the West is, is being led by, by the United States. <clears throat> if we then turn from Britain to uh, the position of, of, of France, we get an entirely different picture. France is traditionally the European member state that has the highest aspirations um, for the European Union as an actor in foreign policy and in defense policy in particular. <clears throat> France is also a very capable military player in Europe. Um, of course, blends in with the, the role of, of, of France as a, as a former colonial power, being very active, for example, on the, on the African continent. But the key idea that, that drives the French position on, uh, on European defense is that European defense must be complementary to uh, everything that the uh, Americans are doing, but should be autonomous from it. So the idea is, the French say, yes, the Europeans were allies uh, of the West, of, uh, of the Western community, um, so we are allies of the United States, but we should be able to run our own business uh, independently and without the support of the United States, because the United States will not always uh, be there to, to, to help out uh, the Europeans. They will all only help out if they also have something at stake. So from the French position, they also want a strong European defense, but something that can operate separately from, uh, from NATO and separately from uh, the involvement of, of, of the United States. So in a way, both Britain and France have high ambitions for European defense, but the British position is it should be tied to NATO and it should as such focus on, on, on bringing capabilities to the table, something that makes European uh, defense attractive as a partner. Uh, to the United States, but the French position is, well, the Europeans need to be able to do things on their own, completely separate from the assistance uh, they, uh, they, they may or may not get 
from the United States. <clears throat> so in a way, Britain and France um, have long-standing traditions as military powers, um, but they drew very, very different lessons uh, from what happened uh, in, uh, in the Suez Crisis in 1956. Britain tied itself completely as an ally to the United States, and France uh, kept on thinking we need to be able to take care of our own business. That is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate aim in, in, in defense policy. The third big member state that has a very influential voice in this debate is, of course, Germany. Germany being <coughs> uh, also one of, the, one of the central pillars of European integration. The position of Germany in the debate on European defense is, again, completely distinct from the positions of France and Britain, for obvious historical reasons. Germany is very, very reticent to talk about all military things. Um, Germany is reticent about the projection of, of military power overseas. So, from a German position, defense is about really defending yourself, defending your own national territory. It's not about conducting wars on the other side of the planet, in faraway places. <clears throat> As a result, the, the German position um, uh, of, um, on, on, on European defense um, is, again, completely different. Germany has high ambitions for European integration, but is much more cautious on defense questions. So, in a way, they, they can partner with the French uh, on, um, uh, on further develop, developing European integration and building up uh, institutions for, uh, for running the European Union, um, but they are uh, not at all interested in the type of, uh, um, of defense actions that the French and the British may be contemplating, uh, either helping out uh, the Americans um, in, uh, in, in places such as Iraq and Afghanistan, um, or projecting uh, military force autonomously uh, into Africa along the lines of what, uh, what, 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 France, what France would, uh, would advocate. The, the German position, um, German, Germany is a full member of both NATO and the European Union, but in terms of advocating particular policy actions, uh, the German position comes close to, border, to bordering uh, that, of, that of a neutral state, uh, saying, well, we, we keep a defense establishment, but it's for purely defensive purposes, and it is not uh, an everyday instrument for the conduct of foreign policy, an idea that would be much more comfortable, um, that, that would be much more prevalent in, uh, in both Britain and, and France. So, the actual emergence of the EU's common security and defense policy, it became a sort of compromise between those three very, very different positions. It actually started when uh, France and Britain got together in 1998 uh, for a summit meeting in a place uh, called Saint-Malo <coughs> at the French coast. Um, the initial deal that the French and the British struck, uh, it was in, in 1998, so in the immediate aftermath of, uh, of the wars in, uh, in, in, in Bosnia, both the British and the French saw that everything had, had, went, had gone horribly wrong in, in, in the former Yugoslavia, and that uh, the whole experiment with UN peacekeeping had failed, it had necessitated uh, the involvement of NATO, so the British and the French had to constantly lobby the Americans to, to get involved, to help, to help them sort out this, this business in, in Europe's backyard. The French and the British position was, we don't want this to ever happen again. If Bosnia were to happen again, we want to make sure that we're uh, able to handle it on our own. From the British perspective, that of course meant the European uh, member states need to have sufficient military capabilities um, to not become overly dependent on, on the Americans and not to free ride on the Americans. For the French, it meant, well, the Europeans should be able to undertake autonomous operations. If the Americans say, we don't want to get involved, then we as Europeans 
we need to be able to say, okay, no problem, we'll handle it on our own then. So the original deal at Saint Malo was, okay, the European Union needs to start working on boosting its uh, capacity for, um, uh, for defense matters. <clears throat> That deal was subsequently Europeanized a year later at the European Council of, of Cologne. But of course, because all the European partners, including Germany and the, and the, and the other uh, neutral member states, had to be brought on board, it resulted in a sort of watered-down version uh, of what the British and the French had in mind. Namely, uh, the, uh, the role of the United Nations as, as the primary organization having a responsibility for international peace and security. Um, uh, was, was underlined, so the idea was, well, the Europeans should be able to conduct uh, operations under a UN mandate. That was a very important precondition um, that, was, uh, that was added. <clears throat> and uh, the, the second um, uh, aspect was that um, uh, Germany did not want the European Union security policy to become uh, something that would be characterized uh, just by, by military cooperation, so um, under influence also of the, of the position of the, of, the, of the Nordic states, they start talking, well, perhaps there also needs to be a civilian dimension to crisis management, because it's not just about stopping uh, wars with, with military force, but it's also about building peace that needs to come after conflict, and for that you, you don't need soldiers, but you need entire you, you need uh, different instruments. Uh, you need to build up uh, the state structures. You need to build up uh, police uh, forces. You need to uh, contribute to um, uh, improving the rule of law in uh, these post-conflict societies. So, <clears throat> in, 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 the, in, in the later years, um, so in, from 2000 onwards, um, what was then called the European Security and Defence Policy started developing in, in institutional terms and from 2003 uh, the first uh, crisis management operations were launched both in Africa as well as in the, in, in the former uh, Republic of Yugoslavia. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this new policy um, of, of the European Union uh, started zooming in specifically on the crisis management business. Crisis management that was to be approached both through uh, a military lens but also through a civilian lens um, of uh, not only stopping conflict but also build, building up peace to, uh, to follow um, after, after conflict. That in practical terms um, transformed European defense into a, a platform that was actually specialized in um, uh, a specific niche of international security, uh, namely that of comprehensive crisis management. So the idea that the EU's common security and defense policy has reached this plateau, it of course has everything to do with some major developments that have taken place in the international landscape in recent years. And there are three that I want to mention uh, in this context. The first one is that there is something called the Eurozone crisis that is unfolding uh, every day as we speak. The Eurozone crisis, the uh, political aftermath of the financial crisis that started a few years ago in 2007-2008, uh, um, has the, as its major result that European policymakers are contemplating the deeper political and economic integration of the Eurozone and perhaps the European Union at large. As long as this debate is ongoing, everything else is de facto put on hold. If Eurozone integration goes ahead, we can uh, expect with a reasonable degree of confidence that that will have a very important spillover effect into the realm of European cooperation in matters of, of security and defense, because we're really talking about, uh, about sovereign member states that are tying themselves increasingly closer together. So that is one very important um, uh, debate that is, that is currently un un unfolding and that will have an impact uh, on the direction of the CSDP. 
The second big debate, and to some extent it's a corollary of the first, is that most EU member states um, are in the process of running out of money. They have increasing difficulties uh, borrowing uh, uh, more, more money and, and adding to their, to their national debts, so they need to think long and hard how they are going to spend um, the, the money that they collect through taxation. This means that most EU member states are currently cutting their defense budgets and that European militaries are uh, in uh, a process of, of downsizing themselves in organizational terms and that European military capabilities, the full total of European military capabilities, is currently in free fall. That is uh, generating an important incentive for European member states to work together and pool their resources. So that is a new debate that is now unfolding um, that policymakers call pooling and sharing uh, of, of, of military capabilities in order to, uh, to cut costs um, and, 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 save, uh, and save money on, on, on defense expenditures. That is unfolding as well, but obviously it very much ties in with the first debate to what extent are member states willing to uh, lock their fates together into, uh, into, into joint capabilities. The third major development that is having an important influence over the direction of the debate on, on European defense is the idea that the United States is shifting its attention elsewhere, shifting its attention away from Europe to the broader world and more specifically towards the, the region uh, of the Asia-Pacific. The Obama administration has announced that it is um, intending to shift the bulk of its attention to the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, as many of you will know, um, there is an arms race taking place between multiple uh, Asian countries and as the United States also considers itself to be a Pacific power, not only an Atlantic power, but also a Pacific power, um, those developments that are taking place in, in East Asia are increasingly swallowing up the bulk of the attention and bandwidth uh, of the United States. That, of course, has uh, the implication that uh, the United States has less time, uh, less resources, and, to put it frankly, less willingness uh, to engage itself deeply uh, in, in the discussion on, on, on European security. The American position uh, in that regard, uh, as, uh, as it was explained by, by, by the former Secretary of, the, of Defense, uh, Bob Gates, is, well, at some point, the Europeans will need to uh, learn to stand on, on, on their own feet. So, from a European perspective, that brings up the, the, the question, well, to what extent are the Americans going to concentrate their resources elsewhere? Does that mean that Europe needs to take care of its own neighborhood, both the eastern neighborhood as well as the, the southern neighborhood? And to what, ex to what extent does that also bring up the debate, well, will the Europeans have to invest more in, in, in their own capabilities to manage these challenges? Now, of course, all this debating uh, of the future, that's of course trying to gaze uh, into a crystal ball. So what we can be sure of is that um, in the past uh, 10 to 15 years, the European Union has been developing some structures and, uh, and assets to become uh, an actor in uh, international security and that manifests itself in the fact that the European Union has undertaken uh, quite a number of both military operations as well as civilian missions into both the, the neighborhood close at home, the Balkans, as well as the, the more distant world. But for going more into, into detail on, on these questions, my colleague Daniel Fiat will tell you more all about that.